Yes, it is um, 4 p.m. now. While we wait for the other of the participants to um, stroll in, um, allow me to um, start with a short introduction and a few housekeeping rules. Um, but, um, first of all, I would like to express my um, thanks to all the participants here and wishing you all a very good afternoon. Right. And for, thank you for dialing in to this uh, webinar session. My name is Adam Basor. I'm the Assistant Director of the Professional Practices and Community from the IHRP, which is in short for the Institute for Human Resource Professionals. Welcome all to this webinar um, titled Leveraging Technology for HR Agility. The focus of this webinar is to help HR leaders and practitioners adopt agility-based approaches suitable for unorthodox and complex situations in an uncertain world of work. Today, we are very pleased to partner Sriram Ayer and his team at hrtech.sg and the folks over at SHRM to organize this event. Also, we are pleased to have Adrian, whom shall serve as our moderator, where he shall then take you through the webinar proceedings. Let me run through the basic housekeeping rules. Now, this webinar is recorded and will be available for download within three days after this uh, session today. For any Q&A, please submit your question via the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom window. If your question is for a specific panelist, please share the question in the following format. The name of the panelist, the following question, so that this is to minimize um, disruptions, um, having participants' videos and microphones will be um, disabled. Now, due to time constraints, we may not be able to address all questions, but we will follow up with a response after this webinar. In, for the chat function, it has been enabled to allow for better engagement with the participants. In the sharing of the presentation materials, please refrain from taking any screenshots of the presentations or slides shared by the speakers. We will send across the approved materials for sharing to attendees in a follow-up email for your reference. Do note that these materials should not be unforwarded or redistributed to non-attendees. Now, um, having that um, all uh, of the way, um, it is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce the moderator for today. Uh, our moderator for today is Adrian Tan. Adrian Tan has started five, business, five businesses in recruitment, career coaching, consultancy, and technology. They led to accolades such as HR Vendors of the Year and Global Recruiters Marketing Award. He is also an uh, been awarded the HR Entrepreneur of the Year and one of the top global HR tech influencers. His current mission is to help more companies and individuals to greater success with the power of strategic uh, marketing. Um, with that, I pass this session over to our moderator to introduce today's exciting panel members. Adrian, please. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, a very good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, happy Thursday. Yep, it's Thursday today. And uh, thank you so much for making time today to attend this. Webinar, where we'll be deep diving into a lot of uh, primarily focusing on HR tech aspect. And of course, you are going to get a wealth of experience from a variety of panelists today, which I'm going to run through with you one by one to help you better understand their background and also a summary of what they'll be sharing later on. So uh, as mentioned earlier on, there'll be four speakers in total. So uh, Admin, can you flash over to the next slide, please? Sorry, skip, yep, okay. So uh, our first speaker of the day, which will uh, happen after I've introduced all the uh, speakers that I have here would be Ms. Carmen Wee. You probably have uh, seen her, has heard of her and also have uh, read about her. She's basically all over the media when it comes to HR matters. So she has been HR for a quite extensive period, uh, global HR leaders for 
uh, with a lot of international business experience. Uh, and right now she's uh, primarily focusing her work on uh, as a board member of HTX, which is under Ministry of Home Affairs. And of course, prior to that, uh, a lot of focus very much in the HR space. So in today's sharing, she'll be bringing to us and touching on the shift and changes within the HR space to share with, her, uh, share with you guys her experience in this and how design thinking actually plays a part. Uh, moving on to the next speaker, we have uh, Aditi from Citibank. Uh, Aditi actually uh, currently heads the talent learning and diversity at Citibank, and uh, she's been she has uh, over 19 years of experience. And specifically for her, she'll be sharing with you a case study of what Citibank did when it comes to the implementation for HR technology. I'll leave it to her to touch on more on that later on. And our third speaker of the day would be Vikrant. And Vikrant is the Director of HR Transformation at Deloitte. Uh, and prior to Deloitte, he was actually worked at Aeon Allied Solution and was also uh, has also served on MOM's HR Transformation Advisory Panel. Uh, and in his sharing today, he's going to focus a bit more on the HR operating model, on how we can make it more agile, but still maintaining the human aspect of HR, which ultimately is still the most important thing when it comes to human resources. And lastly, our uh, last speaker for the day would be uh, Benedict. He's the VP of Solution Consulting at UKG. So he basically leads an international team that supports their global clients in the HR transformation process. Uh, for some of you who has uh, attended some conferences, trade shows, when that was still possible, or you may have seen him in some of his uh, sharing, uh, some of his keynote. And in today's conversation, he's going to share with us a tech aspect on how to make HR more agile. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, I will kick off the first sharing by Ms. Carmen Wee. And while uh, that is happening, if you have any questions that you'd like to check in with her, uh, please use the Q&A function within Zoom to type it in. We'll be collating all the questions. And of course, uh, given the, the, depending on how much time we have, we will try to cover them as much as possible. If not, then of obviously the more popular ones. So don't be, don't hesitate to interact with any other panelists while the chat is going on. You can use the chat function as well. Uh, but without further ado, Carmen, over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, HR Tech, um, IHRP and SRHM for organizing today's um, session. I'm very pleased to be here. And, um, you know, this topic is uh, obviously very hot today, but I want to tell you a story, okay? I'm in the process of uh, moving house and uh, I found in my cupboard this uh, magazine uh, by Harvard Business Review, which uh, has this very provocative title, It's Time to Blow Up HR. And this was back in uh, 2015. And I was flipping through the magazine and I think certain things haven't quite changed. And as I was thinking about today's topic, you know, I just wanted to put a few, um, you know, thinking questions for us to consider as we work through the next one and a half hours away around, you know, a few years from now, are we going to be very, very relevant uh, to our businesses and enterprise and perhaps uh, to the industry as a whole because of the way we're going to do HR, you know, using technology or not, making the shift or not, um, and acquiring new skills or not or maybe even having all mindsets or are we going to make the shift to a new mindset very quickly? And I think that, you know, when I look at um, my work with the board uh, and with businesses over the last few decades, um, the key imperatives right now really is how do we, over the next few years, navigate a very challenging environment in the midst of a global pandemic with obviously, you know, the the impact of digitalization and disruptive technologies that's really impacting everything that we do. And also in a very uh, ESG uh, world where multiple stakeholders are looking to businesses, enterprise and leaders to do the right thing, right? For the planet to do the right thing for their customers, their suppliers, and even their employees. So with that in mind, I just want to submit to you that there are a few considerations um, as an HR leader. And for those of you who are on this call today, um, I'm sure that you have joined this call because you wanted to learn maybe a little bit more about how to be more agile using HR technology. Um, how do you keep your skills relevant? What's the latest thinking out there? 
Um, but I would say, right, that since 2015, certain things have not changed. And I think this is the worrying part, right? Um, we are continuing to see some HR, you know, um, practitioners and leaders not understanding the business and therefore they continue to do, you know, the nice programs that lack strategic impact. Um, they're not able perhaps to put together the business case to really help to shift the needle around the future sustainability of their companies. Um, we are also seeing, you know, HR practitioners, some of them not really comfortable even with technology. Um, a lot of them still, you know, want to continue, right, to stay in their current mode uh, or mode, right, um, so that they are, you know, continue to demonstrate what they think to be their current value to their organization. And therefore, there's no need to try too hard or to stretch. But here's the thing, right? When you are in the moat and the water is boiling outside, you could very well, right, be at some uh, career risk or even at some organizational risk or some functional risk, unless you do a few things. And so, um, you know, a few years ago, um, I was in a big company and we were being acquired. And what we did was, you know, we wanted to train, right, 2,000 over salespeople in the, um, you know, our new uh, parents' uh, company. And we were looking to use technology, train them in our you know, um, products and services offering and be able to um, very quickly transfer the knowledge so that we could um, bring about some business impact for our, you know, our new parents. And so um, I was responsible for leading that team. And because it's a software environment, we use the agile methodology. We came up with uh, videos and the quizzes and the tests so that we train 2,000 over uh, salespeople globally. And eventually with that training, um, you know, our salespeople went to market with the newly trained salespeople who had never sold software up until that point. And a few months on, we actually generated 11 million euros. Now, when you think about it, right, that sort of outcome using tech, using agile with a business outcome, um, obviously there was a, business case to it because, you know, the leaders um, were very anxious to demonstrate that this M&A was going to lead to some accretive benefit. Um, but for me as an HR leader, I think what was interesting was very quickly we turned around within two months. Um, it was a high impact program uh, using technology and the latest, um, you know, agile, uh, you know, methodology. And it led to, you know, $11 million in terms of the uh, business bottom line. So if you stand back and learn and reflect back on you know, some of the learnings of that particular example, which I've just shared, think about your organization because it's got very relevant points about how you're going to create value for the business over the next few years. And unless you're able to demonstrate that business value, um, anything else from HR could be just fluff, right? And who has time for fluff in a pandemic? Um, and who has time uh, for another program because, you know, our employees, our leaders are extremely burnt out or they are fatigued, right? Um, and, you know, what is going to um, contribute to the whole ESG uh, mandate, right, that a lot of companies are expected to deliver. Um, another point that I want to make is um, over the next few years, it is extremely critical for you um, during this season to be, you know, part of, I would say, that global movement, right, of HR leaders who are trying to reshape the function, okay, using digitalization, using design thinking, using, you know, some of the latest technologies, which are going to help us shift the needle in terms of our strategic value to the business on a global basis. And, you know, with that obviously comes, you know, benefits of, uh, you know, having the new skills, having updated, you know, um, I would say the know-how to help you to move your HR career. But if you are not part of that movement, I would say jump into that bandwagon right now. Be very, very involved in picking up either business skills, tech skills, all right, the latest in terms of, you know, some of the agile design thinking. And I will also add, right, the ability to uh, tell stories in a digital manner using digital technologies because, you know, HR people are very good at managing programs, perhaps um, processes uh, and, you know, some of the comfortable stuff, right, that we've all been schooled in. But we really need to be able to move into new frontiers of 
um, communicating with our employees in a different way that marries right, the consumer brand externally and our own internal uh, promises to them. Uh, our ability to adapt and use tech to demonstrate the bottom line uh, results. Um, and, you know, just now I was asking uh, Shriram, I mean, what are people most interested in listening to when they dial into, you know, a webinar like this? And I would say that, you know, unless you're able to demonstrate the business impact, um, and there are many resources and books out there, you know, to demonstrate your impact. And now with people analytics and, you know, software or spreadsheets, you are able to help your organization to do that. Um, I'm afraid, you know, um, I would say five years from now, Ram Chandran is still going to say, hey, it's really time to blow up HR. And I certainly don't want that to happen to us. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, you know, I'm just very uh, honored to be here to share with, uh, you know, my fellow uh, panelists and to learn from everyone else. And then we can, uh, you know, engage in some Q&A later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Thank you for that succinct and insightful sharing. Uh, hopefully, we don't really have to literally blow up HR. Uh, but there are a few interesting pointers that you shared. And of course, I have quite a number of questions to ask you later on during our panel discussion. But for now, let's move on to the next segment with Aditi. Uh, Aditi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, and thanks, Carmen. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you, and it's a pleasure for me to be, uh, you know, part of participating in this panel with uh, a very esteemed set of panelists along with me. I did want to start off by saying, hopefully, 2022 has started on a great note for all of you, uh, and I wish you the very best and in the sort of coming months. Um, you know, uh, if you could just move to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, sort of take a step back and really delve upon, uh, you know, what agility really means for us. And I know that, uh, you know, in the sort of subsequent slides, I'll be working, I'll be taking you through a little bit of my organization's experience on how, uh, you know, technology and agility have really gelled together and how we've tried to make sense out of, uh, you know, everything that's happening around us. So as all of you are aware, our current business environment and organizational priorities almost sort of force us to be agile, nimble, adaptive. And uh, if you hear most of the you know, people or leaders speaking, this has sort of gotten accelerated or accentuated as a result of um, everything that's sort of happening with COVID around us. So in sort of simple terms, agility is the ability to continuously initiate and respond to change in a way that create uh, advantage, obviously minimize risk and sustain performance. And they also, you know, in a way that we can manage and balance the tension between what internal and external dynamics um, require us to do. And our leaders, um, you know, as sort of leaders within the organization or as, you know, contributors to the organization, the ability to sort of reframe current challenges or ambiguity and constantly re reinterpret strategies and reform operations um, all sort of become a very, very crucial aspect of this. So let's come to HR technology. So how does HR technology uh, play a big role as a key enabler for these capabilities? And you know how can HR tech then allow for, you know, agility to be brought in in different processes and systems that uh, HR has. So I you know, strongly believe that you know, uh, HR tech can play a great role in agile communication. You know, it can definitely play a great role in enhancing collaboration, ensuring that there is sort of continuous feedback, um, developing skills around adaptability, uh, giving a great sense of how you can measure and improve measurement on various uh, things that you do around HR. Uh, how do you, at the end of the day, improve overall operational efficiency? And uh, at the same time, you know, how do you empower HR professionals who are there to sort of drive higher performance for their own teams, as well as uh, you know, organization at large? So I feel that you know, HR technology plays an extremely important role and that word key enabler here uh, is really important in sort of nurturing and harnessing agility across the organization. 
if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you know, I just wanted to share a few values around agility, and these are the values that we sort of followed in uh, when we were looking at a couple of very, very important HR tech um, implementations within our organization. And, you know, these tools and technology uh, and the way we leverage them reflect, you know, on these agile values. So the first one is, you know, do we have a change mindset? And as an organization, do we really nurture it? You know, how do we empower our teams? Um, empower individual members in the team with a robust and relevant resource pool uh, that continuously sort of supports their learning and development. The second one would be, uh, you know, how do you constantly assess the needs of the environment, which is forever changing around you? How do you constantly tap on opportunities um, and also identify, you know, what are these obstacles and how do you overcome them? Uh, change management and communication, of course, are a key part to, you know, how you drive agility across the organization. Uh, also key is how do you break down silos, right? How do you turn that into collaboration uh, opportunities? And how do you, you know, identify some champions who will help drive uh, some of these values across the organization? Uh, data is key. Uh, and I think, you know, technology and data go so much hand in hand and often we sort of use it interchangeably. Uh, but I do think that the, you know, the investment in technology leads to very robust data set. But unless we use that data to get insights, um, you know, that entire investment uh, could, could actually rather be, um, you know, fruitless. Um, I think the other thing that, you know, an agile sort of uh, value promotes is um, space to experiment, space to innovate, uh, drive creativity. And also creating a sort of space for developing mechanisms for real-time feedback because agile you know, workforces, of course, make sure that they're not waiting for something to get over, but constantly reinventing themselves uh, through the journey. Um, if you can move to the next slide, um, and this is where my sort of real example sort of starts. Um, if you see this slide, this, this sort of really reflects a journey that we went through or we go through as we implement various HR projects. And I will just take the example of an implementation that we went through, which was a significant um, you know, investment that we did in Workday uh, a few years back. Um, and you know, just looking at the scale and size of our organization, any change that we sort of bring about has to be very well thought through in terms of not just the investment we are making, but what are the benefits that it, it will sort of give us. Um, so, you know, just because we were using agile values and putting them into action, what it really meant was that, you know, we looked at everything from an end user perspective uh, and not from a perspective of what expertise we have. And what I mean by that is that what is the problem that we're trying to solve was at the end of uh, everybody's mind. And then we walked backwards and said, what technology solution will really help us solve those problems? Instead of saying that, you know, this is the expertise that we have within our HR teams and we will find a, a technology partner which will draw upon this experience. So, so just changing that mindset, uh, we found to be really valuable. Um, and then automatically that meant that we were prioritizing solutions uh, over just worrying about implementation. Often organizations worry and quickly jump into the execution mode or the operational mode. But just keeping that solution mindset really helped us, you know, elevate the way we were thinking. The other important thing was uh, we actually really co-created with the user throughout. So while we were implementing, though we knew we were buying a product, uh, we made sure that we were allowing adequate amount of customization. And we were also allowing, uh, you know, the users to get a look and feel of what it is, what it might end up being uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, the last, obviously, you know, uh, important thing was that we went into smaller, short uh, sort of project teams where we looked at tapping on the strengths and the skills that everybody brought in uh, instead of having sort of long drawn project plans, uh, which often sort of become unmanageable. So we realized that as we were implementing something as large as a big 
you know, HR technology implementation, many of these agile values really helped us, um, you know, in, in delivering a very, very successful transition. At the end of the day, what it did for our own teams was that it created space for people who wanted to operate at that sort of high level of being strategic thinkers. Uh, it also created that sense of being extremely customer centric and proactive for majority of the teams. Uh, and it also then enabled people to be participating in each uh, process in their sort of own way. Um, so this actually worked very well for us. And, you know, even after the implementation, the learnings that we had out of these implementations is something we are adopting in many other areas. If you could just move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, like I said, you know, there were two sort of big things uh, that we did. One was uh, the one that I just spoke about, which was the workday implementation. The other one was a big emphasis that we had on people analytics and insights. Like I said, um, you know, often data and technology are spoken in the same vein, um, but there is definitely a distinct uh, difference between both of them. Technology enables us to get more robust data, but you know the data is only as useful as how much you get insights out of it and what do you do out of those insights to drive decisions. So I think the second part of our, our sort of project was to look at data across the organization and drive decisions as a result uh, of those. Um, if you could move to the last slide. Um, I just want to leave some final thoughts here. Um, so all of us are aware, and to Carmen's point, we can't run away from it. You know, the emerging technology is sort of reshaping work, and it will change the way our function would be expected to function as well as uh, deliver to our stakeholders. You know, uh, words like automation, artificial intelligence, etc., are revolutionizing not just businesses but our own function. And the sooner we adapt and get used to it um, with that sort of agile values in mind, the easier it will get for us. You know, 54, uh, 55, 56% of the companies uh, which participated in a recent uh, World Economic Forum uh, Future of Jobs survey identified skill gap uh, in the local labor market to be the biggest challenge in terms of adopting new technologies and innovation. And you know these skill gaps will pose a big deterrent to our ability to adopt technology. And you know almost about forty percent of our current workforce it would be sort of forced to reskill themselves uh, from the core skills that they have today. So this is really going to be absolutely inevitable. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that investing in HR tech is one part of the decision. The other part of the decision is that how do you upskill your own HR talent so that they're empowered and they have the right you know, knowledge, skills, and ability to be agile and leverage those digital tools and uh, you know, new technology that organizations invest in. And uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that sort of come out. Uh, we've, we went, we've gone through this transformation journey a number of times in a number of things that we've implemented. And every time it's a bit of a learning and we get, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, enriched by what we learn. But uh, as HR professionals, I think it's, it's absolutely essential for us to, you know, think of uh, our own careers in terms of skills that we are enhancing on a constant basis um, that would sort of add on eventually to, to the experiences we have. With that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Adrian, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. Thanks so much for sharing with us and helping us to understand your experience, your team experience, as well as your company's experience in trying to do all this implementation. I, I really like what you said about investing in people over and above investing in technology. Because if I were to give my mom right now an iPhone 13, she also can barely do anything about it because haven't trained her to do how to 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 use it properly. And I've heard many companies, especially smaller companies, when they implement uh, especially enterprise system, uh, the, the usage of it is barely 15, 20% because they don't really know, have the know-how on how to make full use of the system. But we can touch more on that later on. And moving ahead, uh, we will be getting our next speaker to come on board. And uh, Vikrant, if you can turn on your screen, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year uh, to colleagues within the region. Um, a happy New Year in advance as the Lunar New Year, uh, as the Chinese New Year approaches. Uh, taking on from what Carmen said and Aditi shared, uh, I'm going to share some perspectives on how HR is reimagining itself. And that reimagination is happening on the back of truly making the HR operating model as agile as possible. And to make that point on your screen, you're seeing two images. And there's a reason why I picked this uh, image up. The phenomena is chromatic induction. Now you see that in the center of the two circles, concentric circles, you'll see that there are two different shades of orange. They're not very different shades. They're exactly the same. It is the periphery around it and the context around it, which is making the color look different. Why is this important for HR is because that gap of agility is still there. It may play out in different organizations in different ways, but that need for the HR function to deliver more is there. And if nothing else, the pandemic has accelerated those expectations because believe it or not, HR did a fantastic job in helping organizations sail through the events that unfolded, be it taking care of employees, ensuring their safety, adopting to hybrid workforce, stepping up and driving not just HR technology, but work technology. We've accomplished a lot as a fraternity over the last two years. And that has only raised expectations. And as those expectations rise, as HR professionals, we have two choices. We can either continue to survive the way we are by delivering on the bare minimum that is required to keep pushing along the puck, or we can challenge the norms and we can truly move to a stage where we are thriving by exceeding what is expected out of us and really upping the ante on the value that HR can bring. But what does it mean? We started off by asking that same question, that how might HR truly become a customer-centric solutions organization? The emphasis is on being customer-centric. The emphasis is on being solution-oriented. Why the word customer-centric and not employee-centric? To those who've used design thinking, design thinking in HR is far more complex than using design thinking in other parts of the business. Why is that so? Because when we are doing design thinking or experience-based thinking in HR, we're not just thinking about the employee or the candidate. In that same journey of, let's say, when someone is getting hired, you have a candidate who's going through the interview process. You have a recruiter who's handling multiple candidates at the same time. You have a manager who is going through his own dilemmas and expectations from the candidate that he will hire. And then you have leaders who are expecting the right talent supply to be there. So when HR gets into design thinking and that experience journey, the solution is complex and it truly needs to address the different kind of customer stakeholders that you have. So is that just tweaking roles and getting people to experiment with sprints? No, it isn't. It needs focus across four dimensions. I'm a consultant, consulting firm, love either four A's or four B's or four C's. Uh, but these four A's are really important. Being adaptable, Aditi spoke about it. It's, it's, it's sensing what's coming. It's about sensing what your employees expect of you. It's about sensing where the market is moving. Solutioning, where we talk about architecting, is truly really putting the focus on what does experience mean to your stakeholders? And the two important pillars which bring both these elements of sensing and solutioning together in today's day and age 
is the use of technology where you augment, you partner with machines. You think of what is the work that can either be eliminated, what is the work that can either be complemented by technology. And there is a lot happening in the HR space uh, when it comes to augmentation. I'll talk about it in a few moments. And the ways of working, which is keeping the HR function together, needs to become more agile. And agile is not just about organizing yourself in squads or adopting fancy words. It needs to drive the right collaboration. It needs to drive fast decision making. And more importantly, it needs to drive a change in mindset that we are willing to experiment, fail, learn, scale. In many ways, if you think of your HR organization as a house, agile ways of working is the mortar between the bricks. And in times like these, the mortar is more important than the bricks. So let me blow up HR for a while and show you how reimagining HR would look like and how adopting agile ways of working can truly create an operating model which draws the best of DevOps, which has been known to drive the best product engineering within organizations, within applications which we use in our day-to-day -day lives, while retaining what HR truly is about. We are a distinctly humane function. We have to put employees, the business first as we create solutions for them. Now, this shift of moving towards a people product operating model is what we call it. People are at the center of it, but there is also a lot of productization which happens. And that productization is important because only when you start thinking of solutions and products, can you address different needs of a workforce, which is increasingly getting diverse, the needs of a workplace, which will be a combination of physical and virtual in the near future, as we foresee, and the needs of the work, which will constantly keep changing as new technologies emerge and as, and as we start creating more value in the time that we spend working. So what is the people product operating model all about? As we bring in DevOps thinking at the center of it, it's about experimenting with ideas which are truly driven by putting your customers in the center. And your customers are in a journey. They are either joining the organization, joining a role. When you start thinking of joining an organization, joining a role, it's not joining is not just about recruitment and onboarding. It's about finding the right job for myself as a candidate. So what are the solutions that I need for finding the right job as a candidate or as an internal uh, employee of the organization, which starts building use cases for talent marketplaces. It's about the experience. And experience is over here, not just about how I interact with the various forms of technology and the transactions that we trigger. It's about experience, which is far more holistic. It's about experiencing my people interactions. It's about experiencing the different practices and processes of the organization. And it's about accessing my data, triggering transactions when I want, how I want, and through the channel that I want. And I'll focus a bit more on the experience because initially I saw Carmen touching upon business cases and ROI. We tend to get too driven by technology. You know, this technology will come, it will change everything. But technology is a means to an end. What we should think of technology is that it is taking away a lot of tasks which were manual in the past, which were time consuming in the past, which would lead us to getting a lot of uh, heartburn and firefighting. Once it's taken away, can we improve the nature of interactions that people are having with the organization? Taking an example of experience and join and how they come together 
is that from a people interaction perspective, we've seen over the past few months, there is a lot of focus on recruiting as the great resignation sets in. A lot of emphasis is being given on the quality of the interaction which recruiters are having with candidates. That's probably one of the most important things which is showing up in candidate experience uh, forms. The next piece is how do we perform? And this performance links up with not only our classical performance management, but what are the tools and resources that have been made available to me from my own learning, from my own growth perspective that I can access? So the shift is happening from looking at courses to providing people resources to do their jobs better. Planning incorporates everything. You're getting data which you're sensing from the rate at which people are joining, the rate at which mobility is happening within the organization, the way we are able to hone new capabilities. It helps us to truly make planning connected. So planning is not only solving for your needs here and now, which is how do we fulfill the headcount plan for the coming quarters, but it also it is also giving you a sense of what is out there and how will the shape of the business look three years down. Those are all products which are being developed by domain experts, technology experts, and between all of the people product ops, you are still not losing the layer of support. You are maintaining that high tech and high touch through having the right advisory positions, which are working closely with leaders to sense where the business is going and the right people support to sense what the employees are saying. This entire view shifts the needle from from the traditional silos of COEs and starts forcing collaboration. And it is collaboration, the ability to develop products fast, to test them out, which will move the needle to the next level. Now, having done this for organizations and having seen organizations succeed with it, here's what we feel are table stakes for success in moving and trying to be more agile. I'll not focus on a lot of them because ROI and, and topics of uh, business cases have been touched before. But what I will talk about is that we need to be human centered. As a people function, as a custodian of the well being of people, and as a custodian of shaping the right purpose and culture, our work will only be good if we are looking across that spectrum of people, practices, and platform. Not to mention that one is important over the other, but if we look at our day-to-day -day work, people interactions and processes take up more time than our interactions with the platform. So if you think of your employees, they go on to a system for a very little while, but they interact with their managers almost on a day-to-day -day basis. How can we make that interaction better? Getting to scale is important. And why getting to scale and having a portfolio approach which cuts across joint perform, experience and plan. An example comes to mind with an oil and gas major that I've worked with. Three years back, four years back, they were experimenting with virtual reality training. And that project was shelved because it was easier to maintain the physical interaction, send people off to rigs and get them to uh, learn the job while they're on the job. But then the pandemic happened. It was because of that agility and that portfolio approach. They knew that in our portfolio over the last four years, we did experiment with virtual reality. Can we pick that up now and scale it? They were able to do it faster than any of their competitors. So always have a mindset that, yes, we are experimenting now, but we will scale up faster. The other most important piece is that don't assume. Many a times we, we get stuck in the notion that we've always seen things happen this way. Today on the back of technology, 
on the back of your ability to drive changes faster and your ability to look at data across the organization, you can truly go out there and experiment, sense what your people want and deliver value over there. And that can be done by collaboration. I'll give an example of one of the functions which is most controlled. Think of compensation. Over the last few months, I have personally experimented with organizations where we are bringing in thinking called your pay, your way. There is usually a performance incentive at the end. People are at different life stages. They, could, they will feel really connected if they have the flexibility to choose how their bonuses are paid out to them, when their bonuses are paid out to them. But the only catch over there will be that the bonus amount will slightly reduce because you're giving that flexibility. So there is a trade-off in rewards optimization. But doing so creates greater stickiness. And that stickiness is validated when you all of a sudden, all of a sudden start seeing critical role retention rates. And when you start seeing the fact that you are, your internal compa ratios are looking better than when you hire from outside the market. So it is examples like these where the biggest realization that I've had working with organizations who are agile, coaching organizations to become more agile, that the biggest shift is here and not on technology. If we believe we are there, Ray Cruzwell always used to say that when an exponential product is at 1%, we are halfway there. Can we start thinking to that, to making our exponential solutions, getting them to 1% and we'll cover the rest of the distance soon. Thank you so much. I look forward to the questions and interactions as we go along. Thank you so much, Vikran. Thank you so much for sharing with us the process, the thought behind what you guys have done, uh, are doing for a lot of your clients. I'd like to stress to all the participants here, uh, companies actually pay Vikran and his company tons of money to get all this advice. So today, uh, as much as possible, just ask your question away. I'm very certain Vikram will be more than happy to address them as much as possible in today's webinar. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next segment, we have Benedict uh, sharing with us technology for HR agility. Benedict, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the warm uh, introduction. And it's a true pleasure to spend the next 15 minutes this afternoon speaking to you about the technology prerequisites and technology implications that HR agility brings with it. And over the last years, it's incredible to see how many of my customers are trying to follow agile methodology in HR. And it's almost ironic in some ways, when we kick off a project, we always start speaking, okay, how can we be agile? And companies are so interested in becoming very quick. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. They stop thinking about what they are doing as long as it is agile. So I want to advocate defining agility, not only as an organization's ability to adapt to changes extremely quickly, but also to include the aspect of precision in doing exactly the right things for agile initiatives to actually add value to the company. For the remainder of this presentation, I will first very briefly speak about where we are with HR technology today and what is shifting that requires a completely new approach to HR technology. After that, we will be speaking specifically uh, using a technology example, both about the speed aspect of agility and the precision aspect of agility to be successful. So if you look at generally how technology in the HR space is being used today, we can roughly differentiate between what we call people systems, so systems concerned with managing the data of employees, and work systems, systems that are concerned with making sure that the right employee is at the right location doing the job that he is trained, he or she is trained to do, and really focusing on improving the processes related to the daily work of the employees. And as UKG, we bring a combined experience of 70 years in both areas, in both people systems and work systems. That having been said, 
all of these classical systems that we are using in HR today are really and almost exclusively focused on adding value by optimizing processes. So by more and more automation over time, increasing the level of technology usage and by that returning or generating uh, returns on investment. And frankly speaking, there's a very, very good reasons for those systems to exist because again, they generate an easy to calculate return on investment. However, things are rapidly changing and uh, the pandemic is actually just a catalyst for some of the trends that have been going on for the last five to 10 years. Uh, Vikrant, I believe you already mentioned uh, the great resignation as one of the key challenges. And quite interestingly, there's a McKinsey study from fall of last year uh, that surveyed employees from Singapore, India, United States, and the United Kingdom, which was concerned with finding out why employees are leaving their employers as part of the great resignation. And the reality is that there's a pretty big disconnect between why employees are leaving and what employers think why those people are leaving. So for employers, the situation seems to be pretty clear. People are leaving because the work-life balance isn't very good, because the pay is not high enough. So very, very hard facts that could be fixed very easily. Pay more money, reduce the workload, right? However, the employees that were asked had a completely different point of view. For the employees, the three most important topics of why they are leaving the company is because they don't feel valued by the organization, they don't feel valued by the manager, and they don't have a sense of belonging with their employer. So these are all really soft facts, right? It's not that easy to deal with these problems. And even worse, it's almost impossible to return a hard, uh, to, to calculate a hard financial return for an employee to feel a sense of belonging. And it is this reason why we believe that HR technology drastically needs to change. HR technology needs to change from only focusing on how to manage the employee at work to a more holistic approach to help manage the entire life work journey of an employee. And we call this technology approach life work technology. It focuses on leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to recognize patterns in, work, in, in, in uh, workers' behavior, to interrupt biases, which by the way, happen all the time if humans are making decisions, right? To anticipate prefer uh, preferences based on machine learning models. So to know what employees are looking for before there is a problem by analyzing data. One of the most challenges, challenging things for organization is to give the employees the sense that they are actually being listened to. Up until a couple of years ago, listening is not a very scalable activity because it includes a human having a conversation. Today, we can leverage technology, more specifically natural language understanding, to have conversations with employees in real language and make it scalable by having a machine drive at least parts of the conversation. We also strongly believe that we need to stop looking at optimization only in terms of reducing process cost. There's other aspects that are just as important for a, an electronic workflow to be successful and to be adapted by employees. And all of that comes back to the observation that only if people are truly inspired at their workplace, they will be able to deliver the performance that is needed to bring the company overall forward. And quite interestingly, there's a study that investigates the financial performance in the sense of stock market returns of companies who have been recognized as a great place to work for. So all of those investments that are hard to quantify in a direct return on investment analysis in terms of employee experience, there is a way to, to prove that there is a financial return to it. The reality is that the 100 best companies to work for outperform the general stock market by a factor of 3.2, which is extremely significant. And again, a lot of, a lot of the, the aspects that drive that employee experience and employee engagement are 
consequences of initiatives that didn't have a direct return on investment that was able to be calculated for a six month time frame, for example. So in that context, the technologies that I picked to, to highlight the speed and precision aspect of agility are specifically around the intelligent listening and belonging capabilities, as well as a multifaceted optimization. So let's first have a look at the precision aspect of agility. The reality is that uh, according to PwC, a study that was conducted in 2020, 82% of HR projects struggle with adoption issues from the employees. So we throw a lot of systems at the employees, but they're actually not being used, right? So the initially calculated return on investment that was based on a high user adoption, a lot of times is never actually realized because of lack of usage of the system from the employees. And quite frankly, I have a lot of sympathies with the employees who are not using all the systems that we are throwing at them. So quite frankly, if you are an employee and you have an issue, you have a topic that is falling in the range of HR, and you have two options, what would you do? Option one is you can ask a colleague or someone that you know from the HR department, send them a WhatsApp, a Teams message, call them on Skype, um, or even email them. Right? And option two is log on to an HR system, a system that the company wants you to use, and try to figure out the solution by yourself. Um, I think the question is asked in a way that there is only really one answer, but the reality is that the better experience is option one, generally speaking. And there's also a good reason for that. Today, none of my customers only have one HR system. There's always multiple systems that we want the employees to engage with. So for example, a talent system, right? Talent management system, a training system, um, an HR service delivery system, a document management, and so on. Um, and, and the issue with that is with all of those systems, it's not the key competence of the employees to become an expert on those systems. That having been said, throwing those systems at all the employees, it's a little bit like putting them in a dark room with many doors and asking them to figure out behind what door the solution that they're looking at is hidden. And this is precisely where technologies like smart assistant and chatbot technologies come into play. These kind of solutions based on a conversation understand what the employee is looking for in terms of information. And they have the capability after having a conversation with the employee to guide the employee precisely to the system that they need to use to solve their problem. And this is key in the adaption, right? Making sure that employees are basically taken by their hand and guided through all the different systems and technologies that we want them to use from an HR point of view. And this tremendously helps with the precision and sense of agility to make sure what we are doing is actually adapted by the employees. Now to switch to the second part of agility, the speed aspect. I did bring an example a real life example from an analysis that we conducted across all of our customers. So this graphic basically shows the system usage in the year of 2020. And you can clearly see that there's a tremendous spike in interactions in the system in March of 2020, which is when for most of our customers, COVID-19 really started to hit them. And the key is employees knew where to go to to find information, right? And more important than that, organizations were able to provide the right information and the right processes to their employees very quickly. At the point in time that the pandemic hit, our customers were able to provide the necessary information and processes to their workforce. And that from our point of view is really the key what differentiates useful, usable and used systems, right? Yes, useful, most HR systems have a purpose. They don't exist to do nothing. So most of them by definition are pretty useful. All of them claim to have a great user experience, right? All HR systems say we are super easy to use. But the key difference is are the systems used? And from our experience, the only way that those systems are used is if they are being adapted to the current situation extremely quickly. And coming back again to one of the things that Vikrant just mentioned, we need to update 
HR systems and tools as frequently as the employee's phones, right? And this is exactly the key, right? There's only value to HR solutions if they address the problems that employees have today. Um, and to give you an example of what that could look like from a technology point of view, focusing on HR service delivery, right? We start by being able to communicate to the employee. A hyper-personalized knowledge base is a great way to make sure that employees are provided exactly the information that they need. Second, give employees the possibility to take action. Update the processes and workflows on a daily basis almost to make sure that all changes are immediately adapted. And then, of course, to drive the level of automation, have a possibility to manage the workflow in, in the background to make sure all stakeholders are involved in this kind of workflow. And the workflow that I uh, have the screenshots on here, it's a vaccine tracking return to office policy. It's just one of the examples, but I chose this one because the guidance the governments give to us on what to do to be able to have employees come into offices, it almost changes on a monthly basis. Hence the need to adapt very quickly. Now, with a, a solution that is always extremely up to date, this is what constitutes a superb employee experience. Again, across all of our customers, employees have the possibility to rank their service experience with the system. And consistently, the experience is on a scale from one to five, ranked above 4.5, so almost an ideal feedback. And by going deeper into this analysis, we understand that a large part of that is due to the fact that the system is always up to date and employees find what matters today to them in the systems. And this is also confirmed by some customers. So for example, let's have a look at Humanis, right? It's a company with 7,000 employees and within 1.5 months, they were able to implement request management, a part of our HRSD solution which within 1.5 months enabled them to automate a significant number of their general HR processes and have the communication between employee and HR in a proper guidance. And last but not least, uh, on this topic, maybe it's also worth to mention. So they have the possibility now to change within just 30 minutes to the complete build and go live of a new workflow which is uh, pretty much unheard of if I look back at some of the uh, older technologies that companies are using. And the same is true, just to give you another example with Unilever. Unilever uses our solutions in France. That's a particular use case for 2,500 employees in France. But again, I love the feedback and it really speaks to what I've said before, that the first benefit of digitizing HR processes is the fact that they can create and modify those processes within HR. And that is extremely significant and disruptive to what happens in most organizations today. Any process change in most organizations today requires writing of specifications, aligning multiple stakeholders, placing an order with the internal IT to do the technical development of the process, right? All of which takes time and this and, and, and uh, increases the overall cost of the process. And by definition, that also means that services will never be completely up to date and will not be adapted in a very quick way. And to conclude, I want to uh, conclude on the observation that uh, all the AI technologies and modern technologies that we can introduce to the HR teams are key enablers for an HR transformation. However, this can only be successful with systems that are extremely easy to configure because this is the key for a useful system to actually become used by a majority of the employees. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm super happy again uh, to be able to present in this, uh, in this panel and very much looking forward to discussing the details and, the, and your questions in the following 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Benedict. Uh, thank you so much for the insightful sharing on the UKG's uh, case study and all that you have done for your clients. I'm very certain there'll be certain questions people will be asking and would like to ask. To find out more about what you guys are doing as well as some of the practices that you can share. 
So moving along, we would head into the panel discussion. And also during this period is where we want to take up some of the uh, audience questions as well. Uh, I've noted that some of you has already entered some bits here and there. Uh, I also noted that uh, some of the panelists has actually went ahead to uh, address some of them. Thank you so much. Uh, but however, I also want to just deep dive into a certain aspect of it. And I like to really begin with uh, what we actually started with earlier on, which is very much on the top three skills. And I really want to be a bit more tactical here because um, I, I've, I've personally been uh, to many, many HR conferences, especially when it was still possible to go to the physical ones. And uh, I'm quite... I'm quite tired of those things which are too airy fairy motherhood statements. You know, people coming in, flew in from US, bank table, and say HR must transform themselves and then just pack up back, leave for the airport, leaving us, all of us, hanging in the air, wondering what to do next. So I think uh, a much better way is really to go down to a bit more of a tactical aspect. So when we talk about, of course, you know, trying to understand, okay, these are the skills uh, that we need to pick up as I try and all that. But but where do we start? Uh, can you even recommend me some of the schools? Not endorsing any schools here, but at least where to begin. But I think even before I touch on that, uh, it, it, that something also came to my mind is, I think uh, for everything that we want or we, we believe should be the right direction ahead, uh, walking the talk is also very important. So obviously, whatever you shared, you definitely must be practicing it. So I would like to start off at the individual level, uh, although some of you might be more on the vendor side, on the HR side. What are the skills that you are looking to acquire over this year or perhaps are even acquiring? Because these are telltale signs for the audiences, for people like myself. If you are doing it, if Benedict is doing it, if Aditi is doing it, definitely it has to be good. I, I may want to lean in that direction as well. So perhaps I can start off with Carmen. Carmen, over this year, what are the skills that you are currently picking up as well as the ones that you aspire to pick up over 2022? Uh, sorry, you are on That's, mute. Yeah, so as context, um, some of you may be aware I wrote this book um, to capture my journey and it marries everything um, around my professional career and what has brought me to this point and why I went back to school, which is why the book came out. <laughs> um, but I think there are a couple of things, right, which I've answered. I think going back to school and taking the break and knowing what is ahead. Um, I would say, you know, I'd like to continue to do more business projects, all right, um, skills that are non-HR, Okay. Um, building a portfolio of uh, business, perhaps, right? If, uh, you know, I don't find something that's interesting for me in a full-time HR career, then I want to become an HR entrepreneur. And HR entrepreneur, I've gone through recently, you know, just last month, I went for my digital storytelling and I realized that, hey, you know, when I published the book, actually I was telling a story already. So anyway, that was a bit belated, but uh, that helped a lot, right? So, so I think, you know, being an HR entrepreneur, um, you know, marrying the ecosystem, uh, you know, how to make money, right, through, I think, some of the, the content that, you know, uh, I will generate, etc. So that's one part of it. But um, going back to school, I think also convinced me, right, that HR leadership skills are very important. And why I wrote the book was because you know, I, I see all the good stuff that's happening, you know, in the evolution of HR tech and um, the emphasis on the high tech, you know, uh, skills and capabilities. And that is all good. Um, but, you know, I grew up in an era where, you know, for the last few decades, um, I, I realized that what really is distinctive about HR is because we have within our minds, right, a set of principles and values that govern how we see, you know, uh, human development, okay? Be it, you know, the workforce, be it ourselves, uh, be it the stakeholders that we connect with. And I just hope that, you know, the current generation and the, you know, impending generations of uh, HR practitioners do not lose that. Because, you know, other than the thought leadership and the content, the technical content that you will, you know, generate through all these nice 
webinars and conferences and books and resources. It's really about you as the HR leader that brings a convergence of who you are, your values, your outlook, your vision, right? Uh, and influencing your stakeholders so that you create, you know, companies that are ethical, humane, sustainable, uh, innovative, etc. So I, I just, you know, I, I think for me, it's important that we do not lose that. And, and practicing business in a very, I would say, you know, in a very DEIB world, right? Diverse, equitable, inclusive, and belonging kind of a space. Um, if you are an HR leader and you are what I call the hatchet man okay, of uh, leadership, then I think you, know, you will end up with certain outcomes. But in a very ESG uh, conscious world, uh, and if you want to practice HR where there's a lot of uh, complexity and disruptive uh, technologies, then who you are as a core okay, in terms of your values and your principles and your personality and bringing your authentic self to work. That is going to be your compass as you navigate through all the difficult and challenging decisions as you advise your uh, tech leaders, okay, or your business leaders. So to answer your question, I mean, Adrian, uh, I think for, for me, you know, upgrading and learning new skills will continue to be an ongoing uh, journey. And I think more and more, I realized that for me as an HR leader, it's really more and more learning non-HR skills that's going to be more interesting, uh, you know, as part of my own personal plan. Yeah. Hope Thank that you answers so your question. Yes, it does. So on uh, storytelling, I think that is a key emphasis that I picked up because ultimately when you want to convince people, your peers, your subordinates, your manager, etc., uh, it's really how you pitch the story, of course. And uh, obviously, you've applied that very well, as well as, of course, learning the other aspect of business because HR isn't a silo. Just like any other department, you, you need to know what you do, how does it impact the one sitting next to you, the department that is, is housed adjacent to you. So all those skill sets will be, become very easy. But I also want to spend some time to check with the other panelists as well because learning is always this ongoing thing you know in singapore is lifelong learning uh, for lack of a better way to put this basically learn until you die uh, which is fine which is fine i think we should we should do it uh, and and hopefully we can also along the way learn how to die in a very peaceful manner as well uh, but death aside in terms of what you're trying to accomplish in trying to make a better person become a better person a better worker uh, and basically just be more productive, more efficient in what you're trying to do uh, based on the priorities that you have. And again, going by the sequence, Aditi, what are you learning this year or what are you already, have you, have you already embarked on to, and, and could you share that with the audience? Sure. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who's constantly looking at adding something, um, not just for resume value, but just as I've done many roles, I've realized whenever you get into a new role, there's something missing. There's a skill gap, right? And just being cognizant of that skill gap and seeing, you know, whether you can fulfill it internally by, you know, people around you and can you learn from them or is there an external way you can learn? Um, you know, when we always sort of apply that 70, 20, 10 principle of, you know, um, where we are going to learn from. So I would say in the last, I would say 18 months or so, I've, I have spent a lot of time on uh, upping my uh, data acumen. So, you know, at, uh, at City, we've run a number of data mindset boot, boot camps specifically for HR folks. And the reason that's been extremely critical is that, like I said, we invested significantly in technology and we now have a lot of data. And I think now is the time to move to the next level of how can you use that data to drive insights and decision making. Um, and it also links very closely to the point that Carmen made, uh, how do you get closer to business? I think business also appreciates if you talk in their language as well as talk in terms of insights that you can draw on their workforce, um, impact, do a little bit of predictive analytics. So I think I've spent a lot of time um, on you know, just building and, you know, honing my sort of uh, data skills. Uh, as I think of 2022, I'm, I'm actually in a bit of a crossroad. So, you know, thinking of two very, very different things. Um, one, uh, I'm looking at investing in, uh, you know, attending a program on change management. Um, and I'm sort of thinking of, I've spoken to a couple of people who've attended programs here. I, I, I don't want to name the institution, but uh, that's one skill that I do want to build. 
And I feel that with everything changing around us so much so often, um, that definitely will add to my you know, skill set that I already have. The second thing I'm actually really thinking about is uh, doing a course in um, SUSS actually uh, on social development. So very, very two different things. So one on a more personal side of things, uh, because I do actively participate in a lot of things uh, for the society. But I also think that there needs to be a little bit more structure around that, which I don't have so far. Um, so, you know, one is more from a professional standpoint, honing my change management skills. The other one is more on social development. So, and hopefully by the mid of the year, uh, if you ask me that question, either I would be in both boats or I definitely would be in one of them. Thank you so much, Aditi. Uh, as a, as a former gamer, you know, whenever I hit certain, uh, Obstacles in games, I often would uh, go to the internet and try to find walkthroughs or guides uh, or cheat quotes, maybe sometimes. Uh, so I hope in getting all the panelists here in sharing what they are trying to achieve. And for those of you who are in awe of what Carmen, Vikram, uh, Benedict, uh, DT are really pursuing, uh, use that as the, uh, your personal guide on how to accelerate your own career trajectory to mirror or to achieve something that they are currently undergoing. So uh, in limited, uh, in consideration of time, uh, I want to quickly move over to Vikran. Vikran, just one thing, one thing that you're focusing on this year and why? Yeah. One skill that you're focusing on this year and why? So the one skill I'm going to focus on this year is my ability to pick up and learn new things. And for that, as a personal stretch, I've taken up um, learning to cook, and learning about Web 3.0. Um, because if you're able to stretch personally and achieve something, you can then apply it in all parts of your professional life as well. So my goals are my personal stretch to pick up and learn things which I've never tried my hand at. Thank you so much. Uh, I've also started learning about Web 3. Maybe we can compare notes in the future. Uh, after I recuperate sure. from all the losses in, in my crypto investment. Sure. Uh, but Adrian, if you just one point I'd want to make on HR capabilities, it's very dear to me. And, you know, some of the esteemed panelists will, will agree with me. When we are talking about HR capabilities, it also stems from the aspiration and ambition which uh, HR professionals today have. Why aren't CHROs considered in the succession pool for the CEO? That's the provocation I want to leave you with. And if that ambition is there to for CHROs and HR professionals to make it to the mainstream of the business, we should then ask the question, what are the skills we need to build? That's the provocation I leave the team with. Thank you so much. If we have another three hours, I'll be happy to sit through and debate on this. I have my personal very strong opinions on this aspect. Uh, which I think I'm going to get a lot of flame for. Uh, but I think it's definitely something worth thinking about, especially for all the uh, senior HR professionals out there who is watching this right now. Uh, but without further ado, again, time consideration. Uh, Benedict, over to you. One skills that you're learning and why. So to me, it is in fact all about, um, about AI. And, and here's why. Uh, in the past, most AI, big data, machine learning technologies were at a stage where companies would have needed to invest teams of experts to be working on the topic for multiple years to get to mediocre results. And we are now, from a technology point of view, we are now at the verge where this changes, where those technologies become more easy to use, where there can be more quicker time to value. And to me, this is the key, and this is what the HR in general needs to focus on. And this will also contribute then, uh, to come back to what Vikram just said, for HR to be even more relevant, specifically considering the fact that the labor shortage is becoming an increasing issue. Um, but at the same time, the human factor in production, the human production factor in a company becomes more and more, more and more important because as technology is taking over more and more tasks, each human that is working, controlling technologies contributes more to the company returns. And hence, even technology becomes more important. The people who operate the technology are that much more important. And having the right people in those jobs, that's key and long-term success for companies. 
And hence also the point that there should be a discussion around having CHO closer to the CEO or in succession planning for CEOs. Thank you so much. And uh, I am seeing we have a couple of questions coming from the crowd and perhaps these are things that uh, maybe uh, starting with Benedict, I can give your, uh, get your take on. So the first one I would imagine is from an anonymous attendee. I don't think that's your name, uh, but thank you so much anonymous. Uh, this anonymous person basically is leading the uh, charge, the change in HR processes in the organization and basically is asking for recommendation for a new startup of 50 employees. Maybe I should just rephrase this question. For a company with 50 employees, if they are embarking on their HR tech transformation, adoption, uh, what are some of the baby steps that you would recommend on assumption that this is probably if they were to ask a question like this, I would assume that uh, this is something very new to to this HR professional. So what, what's your thoughts on that? And, and how would that differ uh, by and large with the larger companies that you're much more acquainted with? Yeah, so with, without naming any particular uh, vendors or companies, um, so I think the key, particularly if you are in this uh, small business segment, is the manageability of the technology. Right. And there is a there's a fine boundary between having an only predefined system that doesn't need adjustment, but therefore is not very specific to your needs, and a solution that can be fully adopted. Right. And, and the key probably for you is to figure out what is the balance between your organization to be able to customize the solution and the pre-configuration that you need to jumpstart the project. Um, and it comes down again to, to one of the things that I said previously, and most likely in that middle part, you are going to be looking or want, wanting to look at solutions that can be very easily configured without IT involvement. So you and your team specifically should be able to do most of the system adjustments because otherwise it will either generate huge external costs for specialists to customize the system or even worse, you will not use the full capabilities of the systems because you're limited in what you can do in terms of the configurations. I, I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, yep, I believe so. But if uh, the, 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 the question, or the person asking a question, if you have further, uh, if you require further clarification, feel free to uh, raise that. Uh, but I personally have, of course, seen many companies, uh, small companies, 200, 300 people, uh, but somehow uh, they were convinced to buy this gigantic, monster uh, and it, well it seems nice i mean every one of us would love to have our own boeing 747 if we can uh, but thinking about the maintenance think about the hangar think about the pilots that you have to keep on your payroll all those actually adds up uh, but sometimes the, the shiny object is just so big so in your face that uh, people just totally forgotten about what you mentioned earlier on the ability to manage it uh, in spite of the fact that you you basically have a very small workforce and you probably need to have just a few champions to manage it in a very comprehensive manner. So thank you so much on that. Uh, and then the other question I would perhaps want to, oh, the other question also happens to be uh, in relation to the HR tech part, but uh, again, Benedict, I think this directed to you, but for the rest of the panelists, feel free to chime in if you have any other uh, opinions on it as well. So this is coming from Merrick Carlson. Uh, setting up processes and electronic firms quickly is cool, but how do you handle the challenge of monitoring and probably error fixing those customer individual configuration? Is it done by the customer or is this done on high support effort on your side? I honestly have no idea why he's asking. You probably know better. <laughs> so it seems quite typical okay. in nature, but Benedict, please, please help okay. to address um, Merrick here. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I guess that's very, very specific uh, to, to the UKG products. Um, so generally, all the customizations or configurations are done directly by the customers. Essentially, the customers are the ones who know best their own processes. The reality is that uh, for most topics, there is no one size fits all. There's always small deviations, particular to the industry, particular to the, to the locations, particular to the people who are working there. Um, so but there is no one size fits all. There always needs to be some adoption. And uh, again, coming to the point of configurability, this is what we feel generally should be something that the HR teams of our customers should be able to do by themselves 
rather than having an external third party that charges um, significant amounts to do all of, all of those adaptions on behalf of the customer. And just, just by definition, by the way, if, if, uh, if the HR department itself is able to do those system changes, it's already more productive than having to translate the functional requirement into technical language to someone who is then customizing the technical part of it. Um, so yeah, it, it comes back to the customer being able to do those things by themselves. Thank you so much, Benedict. I actually see a hand raised uh, while you were providing your answers. I think uh, it's by Joyce here. Joyce, I just want to confirm if you have a question to ask. I'm just going to unmute you very quickly. Or was it because you accidentally clicked something? Please let us know. Uh, Joyce, do you have any question to ask any of the panelists? Okay, I think she accidentally clicked something. All right, so uh, moving on to the next question, a new one that just came in, it's about engaging employees. How will all these technologies HR system come to play to improve the productivity of such functions of HR? Uh, I, I think there's something that we can definitely tap on the experience, the know-how, uh, the, the knowledge of all the panelists here. I'm going to get uh, give Benedict a break to have a sip of water and perhaps I'll move over to Carmen again to help us understand, uh, you know, just, just just some of the, uh, how all this will actually come into play to improve the productivity of such functions in HR. So I think if you look at the entire employee life cycle, whatever solutions that you are trying to implement, you you've got to think through, right? That it does not become just a spate of solutions that becomes an island of applications, okay? Um, so that it really reduces the employee experience. Um, I will also say the other principle is what's the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Because depending on the size and the complexity of your organization, um, you want to also be able to simplify the processes and whatever solution that you put in, it must not make it more clunky than it already is already. So that's the second principle that I'll go to. And then it will free up time, right, for the HR team to spend more time with the business rather than spending time managing these uh, solutions, you know, from a maintenance uh, standpoint or get into a lot of long uh, conversations with uh, IT or having to, you know, ask your business for money again and again. Um, I, I would say the third principle really is around how do you actually um, ensure that as you promote some of the solutions and, and as you architect it, um, that it promotes collaboration amongst the HR team rather than you know, um, causing more, I would say, uh, either infighting or you know, uh, more silos, all right? Because I've seen, I mean, in different organizations that it becomes you know, another implementation, it becomes another long project, it becomes another... Uh, complex, uh, you know, initiative that the company has embarked on, and the and the aftertaste, right? That it leaves, uh, you know, for the HR team and also the I would say the customers is such that it it is a very confusing picture. So you know whether you, if if you happen to be at an HR leadership level, you 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 I think having the clarity around the vision, around the experience, around you know, the value of all this needs to be articulated so that you know, you know, whether you're going to put in a mini car or you're going to buy, you know, a Toyota or you're going to, you know, um, put in something that, you know, frankly, maybe sometimes you don't need a car at all, okay? Um, so be a little bit more thoughtful around how you design because then it will impact on, you know, how employees interact with HR and, you know, how... Uh, the managers will also get any value out of looking at some of the dashboard analytics. Thank you so much, Carmen. And I hope that will address the question that is put forth. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming towards almost the end of uh, this session. Uh, and so unfortunately, we won't be able to get the take from the other panelists. But 
for any one of you who is, uh, of course, watching this right now, feel free to reach out to all the panelists individually. I'm very certain they can all easily be identified and found on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with them, ask them questions. I'm very certain they'll be more than happy to share more with you about what they do, their knowledge, their wisdom, their products, etc. And with that, I will be handing this over back to Adam. Adam, over back to you. Right. Thank you very much, Adrian, um, and the panel members for an insightful session and sharing.